uh, we got Alex Simmel from OS Coin. He's going to be talking about sustainable open source ecosystems. And uh, then we got another talk coming up right after that. So take it away, Alex. Uh, sure. Give me one second. So yeah, I'm Alex. I'm working for a project called uh, Open Source Coin, OS Coin for short. And um, one of the things that we think about is uh, sustainability in open source, um, the ecosystem in, at large. And maybe a bit about the motivation why I joined. So I used to work for Cosmos, um, a small, uh, probably not so well known uh, blockchain company. And I led the Tenement team. And the uh, Tenement team is primarily occupied with building the consensus engine that is underneath the Cosmos uh, network. Um, and I helped organizing a completely remote team which works 100% of the time uh, on an open source project. So I felt the struggle and um, this is kind of my personal motivation why I got into the space and tried to help push it forward somewhat, hopefully. Um, so you probably all uh, have seen this uh, quote, statement, and I feel a little bit like preaching to the choir, especially with this audience and having talks like the, um, the one that uh, was at 12 in the um, main room. Um, so software is eating the world, and I think more true than ever that's uh, open source um, software that is eating the world. Um, and if we see what... Um, current investigations show, like uh, GitHub's uh, data set, for example, which shows that there are more um, projects and contributions than ever. Um, and more and more people use open source, either um, in their um, professional daily life or um, at night when they hack away on things. Um, but for the first time, I think the, we have the true first um, open source, exclusive open source wave. Um, that uh, breakdown is, might be a bit old, the numbers might not be accurate anymore, but um, we all kind of part of uh, the first technical wave where the projects happen all in, uh, out in the open, together with the character that the um, platforms and networks we built um, also have transparency at their uh, first in nature. So, what does it mean? Um, the assumption is that open source is the new uh, infrastructure, and if you look, for example, Sorry. to <laughs> the work that uh, Nadia Ekba, who used to run the open source initiative at GitHub, um, has done for the Ford Foundation, which is called Roads and Bridges, it uh, takes this analogy and takes, the, um, takes it to the point where all our new roads and bridges are somewhat um, built on open source and every, every bit of information that uh, goes around between people um, has pieces of code involved that um, are part of open source projects. Um, and that is great, right? Uh, the problem is that there is a dark truth to it that while um, we see the usage and contributions um, increase more and more and more and more people participate in open source, there's one thing that doesn't increase and that is uh, the maintainers, the number of maintainers. So there's a disproportion between uh, usage contributions and um, the people who actually keep the projects together. So we think about the maintainers as the glue um, that keep um, everyone involved, that govern the projects, that help um, work on the parts that you don't actively see, right? You don't see uh, the people who um, groom the uh, issues, who try to um, maintain uh, a steady turnaround on pull requests, um, if you're familiar with the GitHub uh, model, of course. By the way, if you have any questions, or um, because it's such an intimate setting, just uh, raise your hand. Um, we don't need to wait for the end. Um, and so, yeah, you can interrupt him if you want to, basically. 
even the MC apparently. Uh, so, and one of those numbers is that uh, if you look at a, a very um, popular package manager, which is NPM, 93% of the projects only have one maintainer. If that, those are also the 93% per, uh, um, percent of projects that only have one line of code, um, we have to see. But there's a huge, there's a huge problem there. Um, and the problem is mostly around uh, the incentivization. And not so much the economic or financial incentivization, but rather like um, the motivation that uh, the projects start with and what they develop into. So someone is um, very enthusiastic about something and uh, starts their own personal project. It gets some traction through Hacker News front page or whatever. And all of a sudden, more and more um, external uh, parties start to depend on that. And that dependence comes with expectations and uh, expectations around uh, longevity, around um, certain feature requests, and from this uh, enthusiastic maintainer who um, codes on their project in their free time, it becomes a full-time job with a lot of psychological pressure and a lot of uh, psychological downsides. Um, and this problem extends to like a very structural systemic problem, and the kind of framework that we have, which is super broken down, it's not accurate, and there's so much more uh, that happens in open source than these five categories. But we have a well understood, uh, we have well understood models for um, databases and other infrastructures. So starting with an open core um, or dual licensing, like where you have a free license for um, the open source project, and then you give out other license for commercial use, um, and then using open source uh, software and make a SaaS business around it. I think HashiCorp is one of the best examples for that. And now emerging kind of the paid support. Um, but all of that is also um, unexplored. Like if you uh, remember the MongoDB development recently where there were some license changes and what the implications are for infrastructure providers uh, for people. Um, but the large problem is that you, that all of those don't really work for the majority of uh, software projects, which are programming languages, library, and frameworks, which kind of are the uh, hidden infrastructure, the dark, the dark side, the unexplored side um, of uh, software. So, and there are uh, initiatives and there are uh, programs that run um, things like bounties, bounty programs. Um, if you look uh, towards projects like Gitcoin, I think they are a very good example for that. Um, donations and crowdfunding like the, the Patreon model, um, which is very uh, creator-centric. Um, but the, for us, the, the question is, are those sustainable in themselves? Um, and we try to um, address the problem with two in main initiatives. Um, the first one being Radical, um, which we <coughs> think of as a peer-to-peer -peer alternative to GitHub and GitLab, and designed it for, um, from the ground up to be architecturally uh, decentralized as well as uh, economically decentralized. Because we believe in the um, risk of, um, or the platform risk, like uh, if you see how um, data centralizes, how uh, power centralizes, in, in ways where we don't have influence uh, over the future, over the liberty of um, our own creations. And often uh, at odds with what we are incentivized by and what um, large corporations are incentivized by, and I think the acquisition of GitHub um, was kind of um, an alarming signal and also a wake-up call for most of us. Um, and the realization that we might not put, uh, or we shouldn't put our trust too much in uh, centralized platforms. And the same is with uh, GitLab as well. I mean, Google is one of the uh, main uh, investors there. So Radical's properties to address this um, is, we want it to be right in your uh, daily workflow. So in the terminal, offline first, so the data is with you, it's, uh, you own it, it's uh, on your local machine, you can access it without an internet connection on the train, whatever. Um, and um, obviously peer-to-peer -peer in nature. So no central intermediate and nobody who can uh, control or um, jeopardize the exchange. Um, and probably one of the properties that 
is most important for this crowd is cryptographically uh, security. So tamper-proof and unforgeable, um, which also ties into later how can you verify that someone should earn a reward um, for a given contribution. Um, and also, one of the things that you buy in when you uh, use um, popular tooling is that you buy into a paradigm, a usage paradigm, like how you, um, how you are supposed to structure your collaboration. But that is, not, that is not really the reality, right? Like issues on my project might not be, have the same meaning or the same, uh, like meta or um, can't be accepted in the same way as on another project. And that's, that's why I spoke about my personal uh, motivation because um, we ran uh, the Tenement project on, at Cosmos as well on GitHub. And we tried to shoehorn so many of our workflows into the abstractions that were given to us without ever making um, good use of our time and actually capturing how our collaboration flow really works. Um, so we want to give the power of a platform so that you can uh, program your workflows yourself. Sorry, how are we on time? Um, yourself and maybe adjust it to what uh, works ideally for your project, but also what you've been used to, right? Maybe you worked for a corporation where they had a totally obscure tool and you want to recreate that because it's the one thing that you're familiar with. Um, so that was our first kind of uh, initiative and uh, we launched a white paper last year and then worked on getting something together uh, for you to try and uh, work with. So over the next uh, weeks, we're going to release the alpha of um, the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, collaboration platform. So it's a set of tools, uh, very Git-inspired, um, oh, very Git-inspired, and um, you're going to be able to use it in a CLI and collaborate with people on your projects. Um, and then the other part to that, which is something that we uh, run uh, in parallel, and that's also something we're going to focus on um, getting the white paper together currently, and that's the open source coin part. So that's the incentivization layer. And the idea is that you can attach value to any interaction on your project, um, not only um, code-centric, but maybe also incentivizing uh, issue grooming or pull request reviews. So those things, those things uh, can, can all come with uh, payouts or like... Um, rewards for whoever participates uh, in that way. And the idea here is that, again, this, as this being a programmable platform, that you decide how your financial contract is going to look like. So you can decide for your project what makes perfect sense for the collaborators um, to benefit equally. Um, but that might be not entirely um, the, like the, the best answer to the problem, because it might be um, too microscopic to think about tra uh, transactions and to incentivize transactions. So one of the things that, um, that always pop up in the, in the context of uh, software development is the management of dependencies or the um, idea to um, explore dependencies and have, a, uh, have an understanding how you can discover and also how you find out what dependency is worth pulling in, right? You have always have to make a decision um, and you use tools like package managers to understand who else depends on this. Is this something that I can uh, rely on? And somewhat this is uh, analogous to um, another reputation system, which uh, we know um, from the early days of the web, and that's uh, how PageRank came into existence, right? You want to find the most relevant thing for your problem or your uh, intent, and there is a graph that has weights on it that tells you, oh, this is, this is very relevant to what I'm trying to do. Um, so those two ideas together is the creation of source rank, which is one of the first um, hypotheses that we want to test and will be hopefully at the center of uh, the OS coin incentivization layer to, fi uh, to find or to help people um, understand what your, the relevance of projects are, but also use that um, to um, structure, um, payouts, and how um, projects are going to um, benefit from the treasury. So 
Uh, I'm uh, given a signal to end, and I think that's a good wrap. So come visit us, come find us. Um, we hope to see people try out um, our first tools that we're going to release uh, in the next weeks. And hopefully you um, going to have some, um, some form of participation with the project, and this is relevant to you going forward. So I have a question for you. So I mean, yeah, this 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 whole thing with GitHub last year was like in everybody's mouths and whatever. Um, what was what was the largest amount of work for you to get to the point where you're at right now? Building any sort of like uh, consensus or what? You know, what was the major right. amount of effort to right, get right. here? Um, where you're so at now? yeah, um, I think the 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 biggest hurdle is. Um, to build something usable that uh, does not rely on centralized components. I mean, I'm, I'm very biased because I'm from a product perspective. I built tooling or the tools that the user interact with. And building something in peer-to-peer -peer fashion that is uh, usable in fast turnaround, that is, that is a big challenge. Like also, but also finding, finding what we want to build. Because it's not obvious that you should build uh, or fix uh, um, provide collaboration tools when you actually want to do incentivization. But the platform risk is too high for us. Uh, does anybody else have a question for Alex? No? Good or bad sign, either cool. way. Thank <laughs> no, you so much for uh, coming. This it's really great seeing this, this happen, yeah. <laughs> I mean, they, they like really did this really quick, didn't they? When you consider about like, you know, what happened when Microsoft bought GitHub and it was like you know a week of chatter, and then yeah, it's a you, guys, you guys announced pretty quickly yeah, it's a that year you were going to so. do something. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a year is pretty quick. Yeah. yeah, cool. All right. So then next we got um, who's up next? Lily Feierabend. Yeah, here we go. This is the cable. Um, you might need to use his adapter if you don't have one. That's fine. Okay. Alex, can you take your... Alex, can you take your... Thanks. Cool. You guys need two microphones or just one? I think we just need one because we just have one at the time. Okay, but you can still have two. Really? Yeah, really. you guys are special. Hello. All right, so I'm going to move right on into making charity great again. Okay, guys, you ready for another talk? Um, all right. Um, so, hi, everyone. We are from Ready Cards. Um, I think. Uh, most of you probably have heard of us, right? Has anyone have like like have no idea what ready cards is? Okay, okay. So we are um, we are like a super new project. We are basically now a team of 19 people um, working in a totally open source fashion. We have this idea of doing a fun charity project um, beginning of December last year. Um, and we basically we tokenize cards and we sell cards and then we give all the income to charity. So that's just like too long, don't read uh, version. Um, okay, so just really quick. Um, so the idea is that first I've been working in an NFT space for a while and so of course I have friends working in like, you know, kind of a similar project and then we thought about Perhaps we could do some common projects together and then also doing good at the same time. And of course, NFT, as you guys know, it's a digital collectible, right? Um, but then the idea is that, does it make sense to let people give NFT as a gift? Um, so basically, if you think about collectible, right, it's the kind of thing that you want to buy and you want to keep it for yourself. So basically, you know, we ask people to, to buy things that they like so much that they want to keep and then just give to another person that like doesn't actually make a lot of sense. And so we have uh, come up with this idea that, okay, um, during December, um, what, are, like, what are the things that people are sending to each other? Of course, people give gift, right? But then gift is also basically depending on like culture, religion, and so on and so forth. Um, but all the countries we have like one common thing is that everyone send cards. Right, and then we thought, okay, what about we uh, minting all these NFTs and we um, ask people to send us cards. Um, so the idea has come about and then 
this is the concept that we thought we might be, you know, kind of trying to develop around this, is that the first version of NFT, as you guys know, ERC721, um, is has been used by a lot of, uh, our, actually, our partner projects, like Super Rare, um, Known Origins, and many other projects. Um, they have been, like, used as a, basically, a collectible, right? But if we are going to develop um, that DAP, basically on top of this existing idea, uh, what do we need? So then, I've been talking with a lot of people in NFT in the space, and then we came up, you know, we're trying to, we, we all the community together, like I think everyone from CryptoPunks, uh, from um, Snark Arts, are you, are you here? Oh no, she's not here. Um, and also from um, RapePays, for example. We are trying to come up with the word, you know, NFT V2, people say it's kind of lame. Um, and then, um, yeah, we have Nifty Gifty, also from Dada Gallery, she actually uh, recommended this. And NFG is not a fungible gift. We're not so sure, but we, we are planning to draft up all the documents and put all the case, like use cases that we're gonna have. Uh, which hopefully we're gonna have a lot more user like after Chinese New Year because um, so Chris gonna tell like you guys a little bit later about our plan to go to China, Taiwan, and Singapore, and we hope we're gonna have like a lot more users. Um, just really quick, so our main goal is that we would like to onboard as many as possible people on this space, right? And then we think we have to push boundaries. We have to go beyond deaf sumer if that's the term now in 2019 so we just want to go like you know like really like just come on people like I don't know my aunt probably she also can like enjoy this as well so um, yes so our flow is gonna be very quick so um, we basically mint NFT on the fly right and then so first you got to select the card and it's gonna be something like that so this is Chinese New Year so we use this design um, so the cards and then you can add message this message will be on a blockchain um, but it's also like uh, anti-censorship, right? And then you choose your sending method. Um, now we have, you can send via like QR code and then it works with all the chat app. Uh, you can also send the ETH wallet address to your friend if you happen to know that, which is re really a super rare use case. Uh, the third one is that you can just keep it to yourself. And then later you can also send it, right? Um, then, because of Chinese New Year, um, and it's very common, I think you guys probably know about this concept. So, um, in every New Year, which is, uh, we call like a Luna New Year, um, in Chinese culture, uh, we basically give gift to each other, um, and then this gift is usually money. Um, yes, and then we think, what about the, you know, we can start asking people to give like cryptocurrency as a gift during New Year. And so you can also add money, which is now we have this option that you can add in ETH or DAI. And then once you add money, then you can also decide how many percentage of that money will go to the donation of your choice. And then we have here EFF, of course, Bitcoin Venezuela and uh, UNICEF. Oh my gosh, okay, we forgot, I'm sorry. <laughs> we, 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 we will add that later. <laughs> and then we just, yeah, uh, get everything done and just click and send. And that's it. Yeah, thank you. All right, so now I'm just gonna hand over to Matty that he gonna talk about like all this technology that we've been integrating, <laughs> like we super new projects that we're trying like to integrate with like so many um, I've got my own microphone. <laughs> uh, yeah, so we, we kind of realized we had a, an interesting sort of like little use case. It was, it was pretty fun in a, in, a, in a way that we could potentially start onboarding some people to Web3. Um, and so there's this kind of idea of can we, can we give the gift of an unsolicited onboarding to the Web3 ecosystem? So um, we've implemented some great stuff like uh, uh, link dropping. So basically first person to scan this can actually uh, claim a, uh, an NFT gift uh, a card, which is pretty, oh, right. Oh, yeah, I'll just, I'll just leave it up there for a little bit long. Yeah, it's designed by uh, the one and only Peter Pan of the Meta, Meta Cartel, so. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know who's going to get it, but it's a, it's a bit of a rush now, so. Um, but yeah, this is, this is really awesome because it, it kind of gives us an opportunity to, you know, you don't have to know your friend's sort of public address or uh, anything along those lines. It can 
it, it kind of enables sharing to happen a lot more easily. So you can go through WeChat, you can go through all these amazing sort of chat apps, and it's just super simple uh, and takes you directly to the website and claims it immediately for you. So uh, it's 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 just easy, you know. It's kind of kind of what we're about. We want to make this process as simple as possible so that most people can get on board. Um, have we have we got a winner? Did anyone get it? No. I don't know. We'll just leave it. Can I move on? I'm going to move on. I'm going to move on. Um, so the other thing that we kind of realized is that, you know, we don't just want this to be crypto people. So uh, we want people to get on board who might not necessarily have a wallet. Um, so we're looking at integrating a bunch of stuff like uh, universal logins. At the moment, we're kind of experimenting with Portis to kind of generate um, wallets in the browser so that, you know, we can, we can eliminate a huge part of this... Uh, this huge barrier for uh, getting people involved in the ecosystem of having to you know, go to a DAP and then go download MetaMask and then go fund your wallet and, and all this sort of stuff. So uh, in theory, if someone gifts you an NFT uh, with some attached ether, you can generate a wallet and get started immediately. And uh, we're hoping this kind of lets people explore the ecosystem a little bit more. Um, and of course, uh, you know, there's this wonderful thing of having to wrap your head around this concept of magic internet beans, which realistically don't mean anything at all. So we kind of introduced DAI to uh, uh, make it a little bit more relatable to sort of uh, concepts that non-crypto people are familiar with. So, you know, like the US dollar uh, rather than Ether. Um, and so we're kind of treating this a bit like an experimental platform, things that we want to validate, uh, you know, in terms of usability, and, and uh, we're just sort of trying new things out to see if it all works, uh, looking at implementing uh, give with DACs and a uh, variety of other fun things at the moment, so, yeah. Thanks. So, um, are you claimed it? I claimed it. Nice. Was there also ETH inside? Yeah, uh, 19.019. Oh, okay. The, this round is on you tonight then. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what we really are, we are like a, a small community. We just merged two projects together and so on. We have technically all these like, this good ideas and like a lot of work which could be done. So this section is sort of like the inspiration for you guys to actually uh, partner with us or like uh, just if you're a coder, if you're an artist, if you have some ideas and a little bit of free time um, and uh, some inspiration which I will give you, then you can be part of this. Uh, and um, one good example is also Giveth, right? If you're another um, company in this space, you can just jump in and tell us how you can be part of this, basically, right? Um, so what you want to do is memes, make gifting fun, like make Ethereum fun, um, and you know what it is? It's a red packet, a WeChat. This is basically the, the way WeChat is like the, the largest payment, digital payment infrastructure, I guess. Um, how they bootstrapped their system in 2014. They, one week, um, Chinese New Year, they just said, yo, we got this new feature, you can send money in this home bar to your friends. And so we thought, why not just copy it and use it for like crypto, right? So it's basically all the, the tech we got already. It's pictures, it's, it's memes and stuff. And you could put money inside, which is ETH or DAI. So we just uploaded this, this nice little website, this app, and you can send stuff like this. Um, one is from Aragon, this was for Christmas. Uh, it was an NFT which enables you to access Aragon, basically. So a couple of people bought this thing, and then they could use it as an Aragon ticket. The other thing is also NFT, and if you have this in your hands, then you get a free dinner with the Navos team in China. Um, so yeah, come at us with your memes, with your ideas, and let's give more crypto because it's really valuable. If especially if you have some and like. You give a little to somebody else who doesn't have it, you're like you don't lose a lot, but this one guy can skip like all the steps of like doing KYC at an exchange and the huge hassle, and then you start this this personal relationship sort of. Then this guy knows that he can ask you about Ethereum and so on. Um, think about it, get inspired, and come back to us. Maybe you're a coder, you can jump into our GitHub. Maybe probably you are more than that. <laughs> Um, then you can come to our Telegram and just speak with us.
And that should be it. Thanks a lot. Cool. That's awesome. I claimed that, to, that shit, man. Uh, Griff, you got a question? Oh, shocking. Uh, so I, I remember there was some kind of feature if someone doesn't claim it, then you can get the money back, or how does that work? Yeah, right. It's just like the sender basically um, deposits money in smart contract, so the link has the access to getting that money back from the smart contract. So I can also claim it back, and as long as nobody clicks the link, then it's just in a smart contract. Right, right. Nice. Cool, thanks. Cool, next up we got Daud Salfakar. Sulfakar? Sulfakar? Sulfakar. From Licensed Rocks. You can move us on. You ready to go? Hi, everyone. I want to talk today about collaboration and how collaboration could be applied to this location here, to the factory. And I gave the project name. Uh, the factory coin, we called it, and there was an, an initiative that came out of someone who said we should sit together and think about what we can do with the token and how we can experience that also with people from different disciplines. So um, he started to call something uh, a blockchain experiment, and he called up like various people, and we did that in the factory in 2017 and there we sat together and we looked at the ESC20 token how it's structured and then we kind of came up with the idea that uh, we need a name for it so we called it factory coin and then we were wondering once we came up with that idea how this could be applied to the factory at all and uh, all of a sudden when we had that name like everyone was coming up with various ideas how uh, that coin could support collaboration within the factory ecosystem. And um, it was making tons of fun and I was really excited about that. And I kind of figured out how powerful it is if people get together and share ideas. So uh, I went really excited home and I was looking uh, forward to the second meeting. But the second meeting got postponed, like really short-handed. And then I couldn't make it to the second meeting. And uh, when I was at the third meeting, there was only that guy who initiated it and I. And then it died. But uh, I kind of carried that thing with me all the time. And um, I'm working most of the times in the factory in Mitte. And they hang up that sign there. And that sign uh, is right um, behind our you, you have to pass that, that sign if you want to go to the coffee machine. And I'm also like a dad, so I have to hug that coffee machine quite often. And I always come across it, and I always see everything here is all above. Oh, um, and above all, everything is uh, here for collaboration. And like, if you think about blockchain, how, and about Bitcoin, the whole movement, the ecosystem, I think that also stands for collaboration. And I think we see a perfect fit here. But the factory also has other assets to offer. It's not just this nice infrastructure that we have here. It's also that we have uh, like tons of smart people here from different disciplines. It's not just us who are in that blockchain bubble, but we have to get other people into it and to use it. And uh, besides that, they also have different uh, corporates here, which are always looking at blockchain use cases. Uh, they have a real strong reputation. Uh, they work together with politics. They have awesome events at uh, Yves Berlin, uh, Girlicon. They had the Web3 Foundation here and others. And they're really supportive with anything around crypto. And they also have like education in here. With education, I mean there's the Code University um, and there's also a new school. It's called a new concept, how kids from young on can work on 
digital projects. So if we take all that together and um, if we look at all the facts that the factory can give us, we have like two locations, we have about 3,300 members, they are not all here, but um, they have access to the Slack, and we have 30 plus uh, corporates. And then I always like to compare it to happy hour times, like all those people who are sitting here, they pay a really low fee. Like in the beginning it was like 50 euros all in. I think no one calculated how much coffee you can drink during the day. Um, and then those corporates came in later, and if you want to get later in, if you want to get to the full dance floor, then you probably have to bribe the bouncer, so they are paying like a large amount of money to get in, to get in contact with us. And we have a really strong blockchain community within the factory. I think our Slack channel is like the largest Slack channel of a certain interest group and we have about 10% of all the members are in our Slack channel, and we run every two months like a blockchain brunch where we have people who are just getting together, who are interested, and we're not excluding anyone here. But we think the collaboration between those startups or people who are working here and those corporations could be way better. So if you look at startups and corporates, I mean, it's a different view right now. I think like most of the startups, they use corporates because they want to look sexy. So they want to be up on front, but have them in the back. But there's actual need for startups to work together with uh, corporates sometimes because um, all the startups I know need traction. Yeah? And on the other hand, like all those corporates have like a large customer bases they could use. Um, then I don't know too many startups that are not in need of capital, but the capital sits on the other side at the corporate level. And uh, I guess it's for most of you guys, you don't really have time. And on the other side, like those corporates, they have time because in the time when you, for instance, pitch at a corporate your solution or you talk with them about it, they're earning money, they are getting a salary, you're investing. And uh, I think the whole system, how it works at the moment, is kind of broken. And how can we get to a point where we uh, work together on an eye level? How, how can we do it in a fair and nice way? So thinking about that, we said, OK, maybe we could take that idea of the factory coin again and try to really empower collaboration also between these two parties that I just mentioned. And uh, for that, I think what we need is an incentive layer that kind of pushes us in that direction. And we need to use like everyone who's here in the factory, plus the blockchain ecosystem. And then we can come up with new options of working together. And if I say working together, I also mean how can that value that is created being shared. And imagine if you do something like that and if they would be open for that, you could go to any kind of people who are offering various solutions and you could start trying out things. And uh, I like to call it like, think about an open playground for trying out things. So um, how will you get tokens? I mean, there are two really easy ways here. You get like, um, airdrop tokens by the factory considering your monthly memberships and with these tokens you could do something or you could get uh, like uh, airdrop larger funds of tokens to if you want to have someone in that ecosystem that uh, provides a certain value or if they are up on a nice project that you want to support and this could be supported by the corporates. So how will you spend these tokens? I mean, you can use all kinds of infrastructure here. You could, for instance, book this room here for something you want to do and pay with your tokens. You could go down to the restaurant or a cafe and use your tokens to eat and drink. Or you could even have like tokens you use that other people who are all creating something here offer um, or accept if they offer their services. 
or you can just cash it out. But if you think about that, it's just like using crypto for fiat. It's not like really powerful. But I think there are also other things we can do. So one thing is like if someone has special knowledge and is sharing that, we could give them tokens for reputation. And you could see like if you want to address someone with a certain idea, what kind of reputation he got, and address him based on that. Or you could give people um, tokens for any kind of collaboration effort they are doing. If I help someone, if I support someone, they can endorse me and uh, get tokens for that. Or we could have various tokens, like if we don't know in which color we want to have that wall back there, we could have like a voting token and we could all decide on that. And when it gets really interesting, but I don't really have a solution for it, I mean, OS coin would have been right here. Um, think about working with corporates and building POCs, and out of those POCs, real products evolve. So how can you share them the IP later? Can you do it with a token or not? I don't know. And then there's something like I discussed with G, who's sitting right there. Like he also was working on a co-working uh, on an idea for co-working places, and he stated like to me, I th I think they should even be capable of buying a share of the of the uh, whole co-working space. And I said, well, it's already existing, so it doesn't really make sense. But then I kind of reflect what he told me and. I said, well, it would make sense if that whole community would have a value that grows with the time because everyone is contributing to that community and getting a share in that would be something that would be wonderful. But I'm not really sure how all that works and what I want to do right now is just like collect ideas, talk with as many people as possible and figure out uh, what we can offer the factory and so they can decide whether they want to do a project out of it or not because without them it won't work in that setup that I made and for that I have that hashtag um, there's nothing uh, behind it factory coin like whenever you have an idea or you know a company that could contribute there or someone I would love you just to use that hashtag and else I would love to hear your ideas on that, because I'm not saying I know it. Yeah. Thanks. I think one of the most amazing things about this space is like everybody's always problem solvers. They see, they see stuff that doesn't work and they, you know, grasp for things for, you know, for solutions to that. It's pretty amazing. Does anybody have any questions for? Griff. <laughs> So have you, uh, it looks like you want to do a bunch of voting and, and with tokens, have you looked at Aragon or any other solutions like that to build on top of? Not in deep. This is something I don't want to come up with. I think it should be like a community driven thing. And I have my own thing that I do. I don't have that much time, but I think this would be a great spot where you just gather a whole bunch of people who could work together on that. And I think we have to talk about how are we gonna compensate also that time that people invest in that? Because it's the same thing that uh, OS Coin mentioned, there need to be maintainers in the back. And I always think it's great to come up with ideas, yeah? But it's the same thing, if there's no money behind it and you gotta live from something, then it kind of dies like our third, uh, or our three times, uh, meet up and then the idea was gone. In the beginning there was a lot of excitement, but if you come to the execution and if there's no nothing to compensate you for that, it gets difficult, yeah. So do you have a funding, of like a small little budget to compensate someone to, to make this happen or? The, the ideas that we gather right now, uh, tons of different ideas, put them on something like that, I can afford to do that, and then pitch it to the factory, and then they should decide whether they want to do it or not. If they don't want to do it, fine, 
But then I did my duty, I had that idea, I presented it, if they don't want it, okay. Cool, I'm excited to see how it goes. Cool. Thanks. John, light. You can still you still got energy after the last two days, huh? <laughs> Doing all the cons. I, I couldn't not for such an amazing event. It's really fun. There we go. Next thing is lunch. Cool. So, a man who needs an introduction. I'm sure none of you know John Light from Aracon. Been around our space for a long time. I've been watching your antics for years. <laughs> yeah, cool. So, John's going to talk to us about uh, decentralized project communications. And uh, it's going to take however much time he needs because we're moving into the lunch break. So, you know, as long as you guys want to hang out and listen to John, as long as he wants to take, that's what we'll do. I'll be respectful no stress. of your time. But yeah, I, so I gave this uh, talk at a little uh, community of communities meetup that we had after DevCon and, and uh, MP was nice enough to invite me here to, to share it with you all. Um, so for anyone who is there, some of the content might be familiar. I've added a couple of things, but um, for the folks who are new, I hope this is interesting. So um, and the, the genesis of this presentation came from, uh, like I said, we had this community of communities meetup. Um, uh, I was like, I I'll do something, and I didn't really know what, but then I was struck with inspiration because Twitter deleted or suspended my Twitter account, and I was like, Ah, I'm going to talk about how we can, you know, prevent people from uh, protect people's projects from deplatforming while still leveraging the reach of centralized networks like Twitter. Um, I am back on Twitter now, so you can follow me at Litecoin. Um, so, what is deplatforming? For those who are unfamiliar, um, deplatforming is uh, when a platform that you use to build and maintain a relationship with your audience removes your access to the platform. Um, so w one of the first examples of this that I ever experienced in my own life was when, um, when PayPal shut down WikiLeaks account um, after they first published the uh, collateral murder video back in like, I wanna say it was like 2010, um, somewhere around there. And, um, and then that was followed by like Visa and MasterCard and a bunch of other payment processors um, basically restricting WikiLeaks access to funds. Um, thankfully, Bitcoin existed at the time and so they were able to use Bitcoin to continue uh, funding themselves. And in fact, because they only held Bitcoin, uh, they ended up benefiting significantly from the appreciation in the price of Bitcoin. Um, but but, but this, this, this was kind of a, an example of like, the first like, real example that I, again, personally experienced of you know, a dis decentralized technology basically serving as a lifeboat, uh, protecting this, uh, this organization from deplatforming. Um, so uh, another um, incident that's more close to, to our community um, is when uh, last year the Status Project had their uh, Medium blog uh, suspended uh, after trying to publish Exiled Surfer's blog post um, uh, about, about a bug bounty that they were trying to do, you know, trying to support open source contributors. Um, you know, they weren't able to publish that blog post. And so um, they, they published uh, this post and then um, moved to their own blogging platform. Um, we, we also did that at, at Aragon. We, we got rid of our Medium account and moved everything to our own ghost blog. Um, and then, as I mentioned, like I personally experienced de deplatforming, um, although it was thankfully temporary. Um, you know, it, it really uh, brought home like the issue that you know this could happen to anyone at any time for really any reason. Like I didn't deserve to get deplatformed. I didn't break Twitter's TOS. I just literally got caught up in a bot war on Twitter. Um, they thought they thought my account was doing like suspicious activity or something, but. This was also at the time when you saw all those like weird accounts doing like 
Twitter, you know, crypto giveaways and stuff, and it was, it was chaos. And I just got caught up in that because their algorithms were like, this guy has coin in his name, and I don't know. But yeah, so uh, a more recent example um, that 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 I want to talk about is uh, Patreon. So like, I love Patreon as as an idea, um, and and I've supported many uh, different creators through. Patreon. It's like a, a platform where a creator can create a profile and then supporters of the creator can subscribe uh, to that creator's uh, content and, and give them like recurring donations every month. So it's a way for creators to, to create a somewhat um, predictable income for themselves. And, uh, but, but Patreon, in, starting in December, started deplatforming a bunch of creators that um, you know, may or may not have deserved to get kicked off of Patreon. And um, Sam Harris, who's like a prominent, um, like atheist, kind of rational uh, thinker guy, um, philosopher, uh, he had, I don't know, over $50,000 worth of subscriptions or something like that on, on Patreon. Um, but he was like, you know what? I really don't like the fact that Patreon is just kicking people off because they disagree with their ideas. So I'm going to delete my account. Um, so, and, and then he encouraged his people to, to subscribe to, you know, some, some other service. Um, but this was a really powerful moment because it, it highlighted just how bad the problem of deplatforming had gotten on Patreon. So, what can we do to fight deplatforming and, like, protect our projects from, from the, you know, abuses of centralized power by the, the major platforms? Um, so first, I, I would say build your email list, and I'll, I'll go into why I think email is so important um, in the next slide. Um, Self-host your communications platforms, and post on your own site first, and then syndicate elsewhere. This is the indie web technique uh, that they call Posse, um, and I'll talk about what that means later. So building your email list. Um, the, one of the reasons why I think email is so important is because email is portable. Like it's, it's by far, I think, other than you know, TCP IP, probably the most popular decentralized protocol in the world. Um, everybody has an email address, and so it's, it's, it's like a pretty universal communications medium. Uh, and, and you can take your email list from one like, email, you know, bulk emailing service to the other relatively easily. It's just a matter of exporting and importing. Um, people usually keep email addresses for a long time, so like although you know people like change companies and stuff, like they'll often sign up to newsletters and stuff using their personal email address, and that usually doesn't change for like years or decades, if ever. Um, so so it's a nice like persistent identifier uh, for people that you want to stay in touch with. Um, if it comes down to it, you can run your own email server. This is like not exactly advisable, but it's like. Because email is decentralized, like I said, if it really comes down to it, no one else will host your email service. You can always just stand up your own server and, and, and continue about your business. Um, some major providers like Google and, 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 or Gmail and, um, and Hotmail and stuff are, are, are a little bit you know, temperamental when, when they're receiving uh, emails from a self-hosted email uh, server. But um, you, know, you can get your people to like whitelist the IP address or something and get around that. Um, and then finally, I think, you know, I want to impart this idea that as a communicator, your email list is your most valuable asset for like all of these reasons, but um, uh, most importantly because like you own that relationship with uh, the people that, that you're trying to communicate with. Um, and, and because email is decentralized, like, you know, in, in practice, uh, there's no way for, um, any like third parties to get between that communication. So I would encourage you to you know really highly value your email list. Um, try to drive as much traffic from like all of the centralized platforms to like sign up to your email list as possible, and then save backups because you know maybe one day like Mailchimp or whoever like deletes your account and it deplatforms you and and you have to move to another account. But again, because email lists are portable, you can take that list somewhere else and and spin up and start emailing people again uh, within a matter of minutes. So build your email list. Um, the next thing, self-host your communication platforms. Um, so for example, um, if you have a Medium account, um, consider at least also having like a self-hosted ghost or like WordPress blog 
um, that you can uh, you know post your stuff to both or switch over to do the self-hosted thing completely. Um, if you have a subreddit, uh, maybe consider spinning up your own discourse forum instead. So um, rather than giving Reddit all of your like community like long form discussions and, and, and community traffic, um, you can have all of those great discussions happening on your own server, um, and, and you're like you know much more in control of the experience. Um, the next thing is. Uh, you know, a lot of projects have Slacks or Telegram groups, and you know these tools are like really convenient. Um, I, I used, I've used Slack uh, like to join other communities, and 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 unfortunately, I'm stuck on Telegram uh, for some things. But uh, I, I'm heartened to see more and more projects moving to like decentralized protocols like Matrix or Rocket Chat. Or um, now that status is on desktop, I think status is also uh, becoming an increasingly like, like important and, and viable alternative. So um, yeah, so moving from you know the centralized chat platforms to decentralized chat. Um, GitHub to GitLab. Um, this one's been a hard sell for <laughs> um, a lot of reasons, um, but but. And admittedly, like even at you know, the Aragon project, uh, we still use GitHub. Um, but it's nice that there is a decentralized alternative in GitLab. Uh, it's a pretty great tool. I use GitLab for a couple of other projects, um, and there are other like decentralized alternatives. Like we heard from OS Coin earlier, um, a, a different project called Pando Network was presenting at Aracon, which is which is like a, de a new decentralized version control system. Um, with some monetization layer and stuff uh, built in. Um, so it's, it's cool to see um, people creating viable alternatives to GitHub too. Um, and then finally, you know, I mentioned Patreon. Um, again, like Patreon is really great in theory. In practice, it's not great for everybody. So it's really nice to see uh, Web3 uh, native uh, alternatives such as Gitcoin Grants. Right now, Gitcoin Grants is focused on open source projects in particular. Um, but I think it could be really great for other kinds of um, creators as well. So, moral of the story is you can't get deplatformed if you're not on somebody else's platform. Um, and the last technique that I want to talk about is the posse technique. So, like posting on your own site first and then syndicating elsewhere. Um, again, like, this is a, a technique that I kind of borrowed from the indie web community. Uh, the basic idea is that you publish all of your communications on your own website or your own platform first, and then you share a link back to your message on the most popular centralized platform. So, you know, the biggest audiences are all still on the big platforms like, you know, Twitter, Medium, Facebook, whatever. Um, you can use those platforms to try to reach those really big audiences, but drive all that traffic back to your own site, back to your own platform. Um, so a simple implementation, for example, would be like publishing a blog post on your own Ghost server, um, and then and then publishing a post on Medium with a link back to the original Ghost post. So like maybe you put like the first couple of paragraphs to like draw people in, and then you're like finish the post over here and subscribe over there because Medium sucks. And then maybe like a more advanced implementation would be like actually using um, indie web native tools to automate syndication and keep conversations across platforms flowing both ways. So like the indie web community has spent a lot of time building tools to make these experiences seamless. So like when people leave a comment on Medium, it shows up in your comment thread on Ghost. When people leave a comment on Ghost, it'll show up on Medium, et cetera. Um, so that the, it, it feels like a native kind of um, a discussion, and, and it's not this awkward like back and forth um, between these two platforms. Um, so you can find more information about this technique in particular at indieweb.org slash posse. Um, and then in the future, I'm seeing like, you know, interoperability bridges to everywhere. And we're starting to see this already. Um, like in the Matrix community, um, I, I got to give them like huge props because they have, uh, from the beginning, you know, said like you know we can't just make yet another silo. To make this really useful, we have to 
give away for people who pr just prefer the centralized platforms for whatever reason to still interact with people on the decentralized platforms. So they've created a really great system of bridges where the messages can flow from Matrix to Slack, from Matrix to Telegram, from Matrix to Rocket Chat, and, and across all these different platforms. And so with these bridges, and thanks to Matrix, people on Slack can talk to people on Telegram, who can talk to people on Rocket Chat, who can talk to people on Matrix, and, and IRC, and a bunch of other like chat protocols. And I can see the same kind of idea happening for social media too, where you know, people who have a uh, secure Scuttlebutt account can post uh, messages that end up on Twitter, and the people on Twitter can uh, then, you know, message people who are somewhere like in the Fediverse, like Mastodon. Um, and again, it kind of all feels like one big conversation rather than like this fragmented, like siloed thing that, that the web has uh, become thanks to the centralized, uh, our centralized overlords. So that's all I have today. Um, for, for the presentation part. I uh, would love to hear feedback about these ideas and, or, or questions, uh, if anyone has questions. I, I, I like to jump right in on that. Um, amazing. It's like, I could have given this talk. It's like straight out of my heart and straight out of my experience. We've, we've experienced a lot together on the web over the last 10 years, and the first one, which you mentioned, which is totally the case for me, even though I read Satoshi's white paper on the P2P forum when it came out, and even though the, all the people in my local hacker lab were, were, were mining Bitcoin at three cents and 12 cents and whatever, it literally did not click for me either until the WikiLeaks blockade. When that happened, and I was right in the middle of all that with all of those people, that was when the Bitcoin decentralized thing actually just clicked for me. And everything that John explained here has been exactly the track of my own personal data management, both personally and professionally. Exactly these tools, keeping it in my own place and publishing and syndicating it out elsewhere. And those tools are incredibly usable now. I mean, there's so many bridges like you're talking about. And so I'd like to, to say that like the conversations that I was having last night and this morning were also about interoperability between chains, not only communication tools. But we're moving in that direction, I think, where interoper interoperability, people talk about atomic swaps and financial things, but just the information sharing between chains and data and everything is, I really think, is a big part of our future. So I'm totally behind and 100% right on where you're at, man. Really great to hear that. Thank, really thank awesome. You. Thank you for the reinforcement and the support. Yeah, man. Let's get this up. Let's get this talk up on the web. and. And really, this is... Yeah, I'll share the slides out on uh, Absolutely. Twitter. Absolutely. Spot on stuff. Put it on my website and then syndicate um, it. Does Twitter. anybody have any questions? <laughs> uh, another question, just an addition, like just to clarify the bridge situation, because it's kind of like a hidden uh, software piece. It's not, not part of the metric system. Actually, what, what's best in my opinion, and I, I bridged a lot of stuff, is a, something called Meta Bridge. It's like from started on Mattermost. That's what it makes it a bit, you know, far fetched. But it actually does what you said. It bridges, I think, 15 plus chat protocols with each other, and you can like go wild. And it's uh, it's really a great thing to have. Uh, for example, we, uh, within Giveth, we did it for we had a Slack community running, and um, as a free user um, or free uh, plan uh, team, they would just you know allow you to keep uh, what was it, a thousand messages or whatever. 10,000, so we, we hit that after four months or something. So uh, we actually like, uh, had to decide, do we want to lose our data or let, let it be captive or just use something open? And with Bridges, it was very easy to just, I, we spun up a, another operation on Riot and it was just, we had some organic migration, like uh, everybody could use both of them and so the choice was with the user and now we're pretty much pure Riot, so. Awesome. Thank you for the talk, man. So cool. Yeah, for sure. So the real tough part is that these giant centralized platforms make it so easy. Oh, I'll, I'll restate it for you. The robots are, the robots are listening. Yeah. The, the, the giant platforms make it so easy to onboard and easy to use. And going into the decentralized platform is is kind of a battle because you need to have someone actually maintain it. And I'm wondering, I'm sure you had to fight this battle with Aragon uh, step by step, right, for each of the points. And I'm wondering, like, what, 
you know, usually need, I mean, I have an idea of what you would need to actually achieve this, but if we're within an organization, how do we get our org to like start hosting their own, de-platform ourselves, mm -hmm. right? Do you have any wise words? Well, I can say how we did it at Aragon, and, and, and I think the, the we made, we've made two big switches in, in, uh, in our history. One was from Medium to Ghost. Um, that was the most recent one. And with that, it was like a hard cut. We were like, we were on, for the next blog post, it's going to be published on our blog. Uh, so go subscribe to that blog if you want to continue getting our blog posts. And you did it. We were like doing the same thing. We were like preparing. We were going to do our announcement, whatever, and getting all the tech infrastructure at status. And you came out, and you guys were like, we're moving to me. We're moving to Ghost, and we were like, oh, man. <laughs> beat you to it. <laughs> they beat us to it. Yeah, it yeah. was really funny. Yeah, but, but, but yeah, I mean, it was concerning to us because we also did bug bounties and stuff, and so we were like, well, we're, you know, we're going to be next on the chopping block, so we might as well just you know, make it a clean cut now. Um, but, but, but yeah, so, so, so we did a clean cut from Medium to Ghost, um, and it was relatively easy to set up. Um, it did take some DevOps skills, so so it's good to have somebody who, who's, who who has like DevOps or sysadmin skills, um, who who can help with the the, the hosting situation. Um, and then for for and then the earlier one, the first one was when we went from Slack to Rocket Chat, and and that one was more involved because there were more stakeholders. Uh, you know, we had over thousands of people on our Slack. Um, and, and we didn't want to, you know, disrupt their workflow too much. So um, did you guys, did you guys have the same dialogue that we had at Status with basically feature loss, you know, and moving across to, de to, to decentralized clients where people are like, oh, I can't send GIFs, I can't do smileys, I can't, <laughs> we went through this also with, with Status Desktop oh, yeah. uh, when we dog fooded, you know, and then moved off of that at mm -hmm. DEF CON. So I'm curious if you guys had that same experience. Yeah, it wasn't too bad um, because we, we moved to Rocket Chat and Rocket Chat supported like images and reaction messages and, and emojis and stuff. And so it, it was a relatively clean, uh, clean switch in terms of the user experience. Um, but still, you know, there were, there were, like I said, there were a lot of stakeholders at play. We had thousands of members on the Slack and they were actively like, they had private groups and like DMs going and, and and all of this stuff that was like embedded in Slack, and so it was a more gradual process. What we had a uh, like kind of like an early version of our community governance model, um, and like a governance repo on 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 our GitHub, and we created a, a like an AGP draft, uh, AGP five to migrate off of Slack to a decentralized chat platform. We didn't decide what it was, but we said, look, like. With, with this was like the height of you know the 2017 mania. We were like, look, with all the like scammer bots and and spam. Well, that's and essentially why Status this. invested in in Matrix, why they gave you know, five mil of the original mm -hmm. ICO, was specifically because of the Telegram and Slack, uh, you know, bot, mm -hmm. you know, it scam was, bot. It messages. was insane. If anyone was around back then, you remember like DMs yeah. coming, like it looks like it's coming from an admin, and it's like it's like you know, click this thing and enter your private key, and it was just insane. Um, and, 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 and so we had to lock down the Slack, we created this AGP, we brought in maybe like 10 or 15 other projects that ended up um, partaking in the conversation, like can we as a community, not just Aragon, but as the Ethereum community, migrate uh, off of Slack and onto a decentralized platform, and which, which platform should that be? And after several calls with, um, with the Riot team and several calls with the, with the Rocket Chat team, uh, the conclusion of that uh, AGP was that we would move uh, to Rocket Chat um, because the the user, for a variety of reasons I think it was mostly like the user experience um, was better and also right Rocket Chat uh, was able to make more firm commitments as to you know how much support they would be able to give. Um, it was around that same time that the riot, that the Riot team was was kind of dealing with like funding issues and stuff and so the the situation was a little bit more uncertain with them what their future was going to be. Um, but, but yeah, the, so the, the migration from Slack to, to, to Rocket Chat was a more gradual process. It, it involved discussion not just within the Aragon community, but also within the broader um, Ethereum community um, to try to make the experience easier for 
all of the people who are, you know, not just members of Aragon chat, but members of like all these different chats because the Ethereum community is very interconnected. It would be convenient if, if we move to, you know, ironically, like the same decentralized platform so that if you're a member of Aragon chat, you can also participate in these other chats uh, using Rocket Chat. And so, yeah, I think around uh, five to 10 different projects uh, committed to making the switch with us and, and they did that. You can go back on AGP5 and like read the history. And again, it's just a it was just a matter of like having the DevOps or like sysadmin skills to install the Rocket Chat server and you know, connect it to our domain and, and get, up, get up and running. Um, thankfully, even though you know, Slack is a centralized uh, Evil yeah, you can get your you can get your data out. They can ex yeah, you can export a bunch of yeah. stuff. So we were able to export all of the the member list as well as the messages and stuff and import it into into Rocket Chat with all the channels and it wasn't, you know, exactly the same, but it was it was a pretty clean migration. Um, and and so yeah, it it, w it went pretty well, but that was a more gradual process and I think just what's important is having the tech skills to be able to do the self-hosting or you know, whether that's a volunteer in your community um, who has those skills or whether you, ha you can budget uh, maybe like a part-time DevOps person to, to manage the servers. Yeah, I think even, I mean, Ghost has gotten really easy now as well. It's improved over the last, over the last year, the self-hosting of Ghost and things. Yeah, and cool. so I know we got lunch coming up soon, so I don't yeah. want to cut too much into that, but I think we have time for maybe one more question. Okay, thanks for the talk. Um, I'm totally agree with um, interoperability because it just like we've been thinking like so much like where we should you know put our conversation like on and where where are the communities and you know and I think just really to quickly reflect on the human civilization right now. I mean we have like different like religion, culture, languages, right? It's not possible that we can migrate all the community into the one platform. But then it's also like, I've been thinking about putting Radicats on like Mastodon, for example, and then it became like not really cool anymore, and then <laughs> so then we're too late, and then we're thinking about Scatterbot, and then it just, all these things happening, and, and all um, DAT, like also thinking would be cool if we could deploy on that. Um, but then I think when, um, for open source project, it boils down to basically like human power, right? The hours, so it's it's yeah. really difficult. So I don't know. Yeah, maybe I'll just go into your document and we kind of like follow your path. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Perhaps at least um, if there are already some communities there and some dApp that are already in there, it would be kind of easier than to just kind of like go alone and start off like stuff. So yeah, it's not a question. Yeah, I mean, especially for open source projects, um, you know, resources are really limited. You have to be wise how you use them. And sometimes just the biggest bang for your buck is using the centralized things, you know, and, but, but I think, you know, having at least, again, like some things that you own, some communications that you own, even again, if it's just your email list, like the email list is so crucial. Um, but yeah, having, having some way to have like a direct connection with, with your users that isn't necessarily mediated by one of the big uh, central platforms would be good so that if anything does happen, you know, you get your account shut down or the platform itself shuts down, goes out of business, whatever, like, you know, you have some way that you can keep those relationships and, and, and point people to the new home base wherever you, wherever you set up. It so. sounds a little bit an anachronistic, but email, but he's, you're, I have my email unbroken from 1981, from my first email address. Okay. I've been able to keep through every client, every, every system I've been able, I have it in mailboxes and mail, my complete email history since 1981 when I got on the internet. And it's definitely the resource that you can find and keep track, keep track of people. And yeah. this deplatforming has been going on. Do you guys remember Delicious? Link, yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Delicious gets bought by Yahoo. Now we have Flickr went to Yahoo again, and now you're getting your thing. I've been getting deplatformed by every by every centralized service since it came online. I was a beta user for LinkedIn. I mean, every single one of these projects is. I've been deplatformed by every single one. Um, and I've always kept my data on a hard drive, none of the stuff in the cloud. I mean, I can't reiterate, really, after 35 years of being on the internet, how absolutely, totally spot on what it is that John is saying here is, man. Keep a hold of your own data. Make sure that you transfer it, back it up any way that you can, because you will get deplatformed. 
every single one of these motherfuckers will take you offline, either for political or financial reasons, yeah? Excuse my language, but I've, I've experienced it with every single advanced platform. And the most exciting thing about Web 3.0 and, and all of this cryptography and all of these things that we're doing is, is that you literally have the possibility now to be data sovereign and actually to have it be secure. This is, a, this is a completely revolutionary thing that's happening in this space that we're all working in here, really. It's an amazing, amazing community to be a part of. Yeah. Let's get some lunch. Thank you all. Thank you all. Yeah, awesome, John. Thanks a lot, man.